Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, Science Fellow, Principal Atmospheric Scientist for Nutrient Ag Solutions. And this is what it looks like where I've been recording here over the entire duration of COVID down here in this corner of my basement. And why I'm coming to you like this today is I did some research over the last couple of weeks where I looked at how you all were viewing my content and I learned two important things. The first thing is this. I get up very early in the morning. I have a 2 a.m. start to produce the content. I looked at how you all watch the content and there's very few that actually watch it early in the morning. The majority of you watch it later in the day or that evening or even the next couple of days. So thinking about that, I realized that if I would wait until I got the midday model runs in, doing an analysis of the trends will give you give you better information about what both the near-term and the long-term weather forecasts are going to be. Plus, many of you are already subscribed to my daily weather intelligence report. I'm still sending that thing out early in the morning. So if you need to see what's going on right now and get that big picture overview fast, right early in the morning, it'll be there. By the way, I'm going to be releasing new site-specific weather forecast data in that report very soon. You can email me at eric.snow nodgrass at nutrient.com to get signed up. I'll make sure you get that. Uh, the next thing I learned was this. A lot of you uh, watch my videos kind of at two different lengths. There's a bunch of you that watch about seven minutes of it. And then there's another group of you that watch everything to the very bitter end. And that's great. I appreciate you all doing that. But that tells me that maybe I could serve you all better by releasing two separate videos. One that in about five to seven minutes covers the most important details about the next few weeks to maybe the next month in terms of the weather pattern. And then I'll release a second video each Monday and Thursday that goes out there uh, and gets into details, teaches you what I know about the weather so that you can learn along with me uh, and caters to that group that likes the the more detailed content. Well, I'll do it both. It's a lot of fun. But I'm going to start releasing them later in the day on Mondays and Thursdays. Uh, that'll allow me to kind of uh, adopt to some or adapt to some more normal sleep schedule, uh, which will help me out, I think, tremendously with uh, just doing the things I do. And hopefully this helps you all out as well. So today on Tuesday, since we took Memorial Day off, uh, I'm going to focus here specifically just on the short duration video. So let's dig into this. This first map right here shows the temperature anomalies or differences from over the last seven days. And there's no doubt that the end of May came in cold if you're east of the Rocky Mountains. The West has been building in heat and they're right now in the middle of enduring extremely warm temperatures. But with that colder weather, take a look at this graphic. It shows you how many hours were spent below freezing from the 27th of May through the 30th. Now, and if you look closely, I can kind of draw a line here. North of that line, we had several locations that not only had freezes, but also had frost, patchy frost, where the colder kind of drained into the low-lying elevations. And that's extremely late. Now, I have yet to hear uh, from reports of, as to what damage occurred because of this very late frost. If you want to, put them in the comments. I read all of those and try to respond to as many of them as I, as I can. But look at this change that's coming. Over the next five days, we're going to continue with extreme heat in the west where the excessive heat warnings are already in place. That extends not only from the Central Valley of California, but into Oregon, the Snake River Valley, the Columbia Basin, and then extending here into the Canadian Prairie and moving into a large ridge that's going to set up over the Great Lakes. But over the next five days, just a lot of rain and cloud cover over the southern plains to the Mid-South is going to keep things on the cooler side of normal. As we fast forward out there day 5 through 10, this gets us out to the 10th of June, we now start to see the way the new pattern is going to evolve. There will be a trough here building into a large ridge that's going to center itself over the Great Lakes, and the flow is going to have to go over the top of it just like this. We're going to keep that cooler bias south because of a high-pressure cell here in the low levels of the atmosphere that's pumping moisture around, keeping cloud cover and rain uh, kind of continual down here for quite some time. But let me take those drawings off there. That's your day 5 through 10 time period getting you out to the middle of this month. Now from there, let's go out and look at precipitation. Over the last couple of weeks, this map shows the percent of normal precipitation. We watched a large high that came down through the Midwest and then established itself here over the east. And that high pressure blocked a lot of moisture return, a lot of subsidence in the atmosphere, keeping things very dry and at times very hot over the southeast. On the back side of it, though, we just had this almost like a pipeline of moisture streaming through the southern plains, hitting the high plains, and even getting moisture to the northern plains. But there are pockets that have been missed. You can see the red showing up here. And out west, extremely dry month of May for many in the western United States. Now, over the weekend, very stormy in that same area in through here. 
But as we watched one low pressure system exit, we did return some moisture to the Mid-Atlantic and the Carolinas. Again, desperately needed, and even some strong storms that came through Minnesota and Wisconsin right in through here. But let's look at this bigger picture by examining soil moisture. This is the top 16 inches of soil moisture. And as you look at this very carefully, we notice that the Carolinas continue to see problems with their subsoil moisture. The Eastern Corn Belt is dry, extending here along and north of I-80, but getting into Iowa, Minnesota, and the Dakotas. Now, we're not going to correct the dryness that's out in the West. We're beyond the wet season. That's going to be con a continual concern of mine. But here in the Southern Plains to the High Plains, it is saturated. And that's something important to be watching because June 1st marks the beginning of hurricane season. And should any tropical system develop over the next, I don't know, 30 to 60 days, if it comes into this area, it's going to fall on very, very wet soil. Now, nothing in the next five days is, or even the next 10 days is in the outlook, but I wanted to keep an eye on that. Precipitation next. It's best seen by looking at the flow of the atmosphere. Now watch this. As we work our way through this week into Thursday and Friday, what we end up getting is that ridge spreading the heat farther to the east, but this cutoff low to the south is what's tending to keep things quite humid and a lot of rainfall in Texas. There's also a, a low-level ridge here just off the east coast that's pumping moisture into it as well. So as we get out here into the weekend, the pattern really just favors trough, ridge going up to Alaska, deep trough in the west, knocking those temperatures back, and a big ridge right here centered between the Great Lakes uh, and over toward like the Hudson Valley. Now watch this. Going through next week into next weekend, that ridge in both the GFS and in the European retrogrades and sets up right here. And that's something I want to watch carefully because this would indicate uh, hotter, drier conditions moving into the Midwestern part of the United States. But let me bring a point to that. First, precip. I just left this out here almost out at day nine. Now, as you look at that, we notice a couple of things. This is one wet corridor and there's another here. And we're going to see if storms can come back into the northern plains. Now, how does that all evolve? Watch. Over the next three days, I'll rock back and forth. There's a low pressure system here today that's moving through the Ohio River Valley into the northeast. Its front by Thursday and Friday will start to set up right here, bringing in a good chance for storms Thursday and Friday. But there's a high parked off the coast that's going to feed moisture around this. So coastal Carolinas are going to continue to see storms. But as I go out here past Saturday into Sunday, Monday, where that cutoff low is, I know I'm rocking back and forth, but watch Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas. That's where the cutoff low continues to bring in the storms. So we're going to add more rain to very wet conditions down here. Into the middle of next week, this is when the West Coast Ridge develops and we start, excuse me, the West Coast trough develops and the ridge moves that was over the West Coast. It moves fully into the eastern part of the United States. Now, the models are attempting, they've done this for the last couple of runs, to return a more stormy pattern to this section of the United States and the Canadian Prairie. And we're going to have to call that into question. And the reason why is, what, for the last six weeks, the models have over-promised and under-delivered on the rainfall to that area. So I'm going to have to continue questioning that. But the week two pattern from the European, well, you see that it's calling for those storms here a drier stretch right in through there, well predicted by the models out over the last month or so. But you see this? This is an area that the models don't agree on, down here from Texas over to the Carolinas. Because while the European Ensemble keeps that wetter, the GFS over the same time period is drier here. It does keep this pocket of the Northern Plains and Upper Midwest and Canadian Prairie stormy. But I said the models keep over predicting, under developing the moisture that's in that area. All right, that's your next two weeks. Let's briefly talk about the longer term here. What I'm going to do is give you this northern hemisphere view of the upper level flow pattern through the 11th of July. And I'm just going to make a, a bold statement here and tell you that even though you know I have high praise for our models, including the European, it is not lined up with what's going to happen. And this is why. The models are predicting a flow pattern that looks just like this. That's the jet stream. If I were writing a textbook right now and I had to show you what the early summer jet stream pattern on average looks like, it's this, which means there's no discernible signal yet 
as to whether or not this precipitation pattern that it's calling for. In fact, let's go down to a North American view here, and I'm going to switch this over to the next 30 days of precip. Again, this is the 10th of June through the 11th of July. And you see how it's wanting to keep this whole area stormy? I don't think this is going to be the way this shapes up. And I've got a lot of reasons for that. Most of them revolve around the ocean temperature pattern, the MGO getting stuck in null space, and no discernible signals outside of that, other than it's cold off the west coast of North America. And I'm going to talk on Thursday about what that could mean in my longer duration video looking out there farther. So we'll stop it here on the short duration video. And I appreciate your attention, especially let me explain to you what I'm going to be changing up here. I hope it serves you all better. But uh, with that, we'll wrap it up. Appreciate it. Thank you.